Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the center, and we're very pleased to be doing this webinar this afternoon on Latin American Studies research virtually during a time of pandemic. And we're particularly pleased to have with us Lila Darpenza, uh, who is here at the University of California, Berkeley, as the librarian for Caribbean and Latin American collections, where he selects and acquires resources about the region and its diaspora. Uh, Dr. Pensy has a PhD in library science from UCLA. Uh, but this formal introduction understates dramatically the contribution he makes to the campus in general and to the Center for Latin American Studies in particular. His knowledge, skill, and passion for the region have been of great value for students, faculty, and people who work on the campus. Our format will be very simple. I will be turning it over uh, to Dr. Penzi in a moment. Uh, we encourage you, if you have questions, to submit them to Janet at ho host, uh, and to keep the questions, if possible, general, and then we'll get to as many as possible after uh, Dr. Penzi's presentation. We also will be posting this video online on Monday afternoon, Pacific time, and we will be listing office hours virtually uh, for Dr. Penzi for those of you who have additional questions that you'd like to ask. Before turning it over to him, I'd like to make several very brief remarks. A few hours ago, The Economist magazine had a headline that went out online, Is Globalization Dead? Well, quite visibly in the midst of this crisis, it's on life support, but in some ways it has expanded in a very positive direction. Witness this webinar. We have participants today uh, in this webinar from Germany, from Ireland, from Spain, from Mexico, from Brazil, from Chile, and other uh, countries throughout the world particularly in Latin America. We have people participating from across the United States, from New York, North Carolina, Oregon, Arizona, Texas, Washington, and many other states. So this as a research community is a very positive dimension of what's taking place in the midst of very troubled times. Uh, but also we plan to do more of these research webinars as well as a very active program uh, of webinars from the Center for Latin American Studies. There's one thing I'd like to recognize before we begin, and that's during these deeply troubled times, the extraordinary contributions that libraries in general and the libraries at UC Berkeley in particular are making. We tend to take them for granted on a day-to-day -day basis, but they do something rather remarkable. They are a repository of culture, ideas, experiences, great manuscripts. They are valuable at any time. They are vital in many ways at the heart and soul of a democracy during deeply troubled times. And I'd like to give two brief examples of this at the libraries at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, in our undergraduate library, the Moffitt Library, we have a cafe that commemorates the free speech movement, which took place on the Berkeley campus in the early 60s and galvanized in many ways, many social movements throughout the country and throughout the world in its wake. When you walk into that cafe, there's a large plaque with a photo of Mario Savio, one of the remarkable young leaders at the time. And under his photo, it says, free speech is just below the angels. More recently, uh, in 2007, 
uh, when we were in the midst of the Iraq war for the United States. Uh, Fernando Botero, the extraordinary world acclaimed artist who was born in Colombia, did a set of paintings and drawings about what took place at the Abu Ghraib prison during this war. Museums throughout the United States all passed on showing this collection. It was ultimately shown on the University of California at Berkeley campus. The exhibit was curated by the Center for Latin American Studies, but it physically was housed and would have been impossible without the extraordinary uh, contribution of the Berkeley Doe Library. Uh, and as, as a result of that, uh, these ideas spark discussion uh, and great visibility and really uh, engagement throughout the United States. One of the things that was said as the uh, exhibit was up is that controversial ideas are no strangers to libraries. They have been on the shelves for centuries. What the Berkeley Library has done that's new is it has put them on the walls in the form of paintings. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lilidar. Good afternoon, everybody. Buenas tardes, boa tarde, and boa noite. Um, I wanted to thank Professor Harley Scheiken and the staff of the class for inviting me to speak today about what are the possibilities for those who do not have access to the physical libraries. That includes, I believe, most of us. The idea of this presentation came to me when we closed down due to the shelter in place order and I was answering a reference question. The reference question was a trick question, I thought, but it was not. There is a copy of a book of one of our well-known professors from Spanish and Portuguese department. Um, her name is Professor Yvonne de Valle, and it was a 2009 book called Escribiendo desde los Márgenes, Colonialismo y Jesuitas en el Siglo XVIII. And a graduate student who was, who is in the process of writing his, uh, uh, his or her dissertation had asked me if I can locate uh, an e-copy of it. It was published in 2009 by Siglo XXI Editores in uh, Ciudad de Mexico. And I tried and tried and I was unable to secure a copy of it. See, I felt like a, a failure. How I cannot meet my student's need when he needs the book most to write his dissertation and how can I solve this problem? Since I like to solve problems, I'm a problem solver, right? Because the times are, some people say dark, but I always try to be optimist and solve the problems. So I went ahead and looked into one of our databases called ProQuest Digital Dissertations. And I found uh, her 2004 dissertation that was entitled Escrituras Globales y Escrituras Fronterizas, Encuentros y Desencuentros y Desencuentros y Pro de Proyectos Indígenas y Misioneros en las Fronteras de Nueva España, um, which she defended in 2004. What I'm saying is that if we cannot find the exact title, perhaps we can find alternate source of information that to a certain extent approximates the information a student might need. Well, I'm not saying that digital resources are almighty. What do I mean by that? You, there are a lot of rare books which are available only in the paper format. And let's not talk about the rare books. There are also modern books which are only in the paper format, uh, such as Lil Milagro, the Esperanzas, Cartas y Poemas, published in San Salvador in 2013, I failed to find a digital copy. So I want this exhibition, uh, this presentation to be more of a dialogue. And I will start by sharing my screen about how I went about solving some of the issues. So let me start with the presentation and I'll share the, there you go. So let's go back. The title was already shown to you, so I will not repeat the title. So I explained to you why this 
why is this presentation on the screen you see like some um, text uh, and this is for the libraries e resources that can be accessed remotely and there is a library guide which i have created specifically for this presentation the guide focuses on several key resources i'm not saying that it's a problem solved medicine for all resources because as you know digital resources keep on multiplying then we will briefly talk about how to access some of the articles ebooks some of the databases open access and then we will have a, a brief concluding remarks and then question and answers if time permits so what i did was i went ahead and created a library guide as soon as this crisis hit the whole idea behind creating this guide was to to educate ourselves with what are our possible possibilities and to that extent um, i create i focused on brief resources as you can see the guide in front of you it has three columns on the my right left hand side your i believe also on the left hand side open access resources uh, is the one there are several open access resources from some parts of latin america which might be of use to our users uh, then there is a hathi trust emergency temporary access service which was a great blessing for all of us um, let me, uh, i will speak briefly about it hathi trust uh was created as a consortium of the libraries uh, academic libraries and they have enabled access to the in copyright content which is owned by the library for the purpose of this covid-19 crisis what do you you go to the website you authenticate using your calnet id and password and then you can look for the book which is available in digital format in temporary access mode you have to check that book out to yourself it is checked out for 1 hour beneath that particular box you see general resources and one of the important resources which i would like to highlight in this particular facet and i'll go over it is latin american and caribbean digital primary sources created by salam salam is a professional organization of latin american studies uh latin american uh, subject specialist in united states the other organization is lasa where we have a librarian section below it you will see vendor publisher gateways to the licensed primary sources i know that many of our colleagues who are joining us today are from all over the international world and perhaps they might not be able to directly access these sources simply because we need to have our um calnet id to access them with the password uh, because of the proprietary nature of these databases you know it's a paid content so but still our students can access them who are registered on the site you can see a licensed news facet where you can see what kind of periodicals or news resources such as caribbean newspapers are available or foreign broadcast information services available this is a guide in progress and i would like your also some suggestions if you would like to give to us later on about what i should add i'll be more grateful there are other latin american sources about francophone lusophone and dutch speaking latin america because i thought it's important to include uh, these languages also there are select secondary sources some students say oh i have an undergraduate paper to write and i need five articles so these resources might be of help to them in the guide also you can see films and media facet where you can see uh, canopy to which we subscribe and then memoria chilena and portal de cine latin americano and cine pr which is a puerto rican site and then i have created a, another facet called literature and culture so with that i will i'm just going to i'm going to show you my presentation and we can go ahead and cover briefly the all of the facets so for the articles as you can see most of us are familiar with the library's website and um, you there is a google like box in the center which says start your search which is open to anybody this database uh, this particular catalog and you can type in 
Under the start, start your search, you also see OSCE cat, which is our library's catalog. Uh, I have not shown it, but if you click on it, it will open another window and you can see uh, our library's catalog in its previous iteration. This is a second generation catalog, which is which tells you what kind of materials you can search. And I did a search for Francisco Madero, no, and as a keyword and Huerta. Uh, and you can see that it shows you on the left hand side that do we have access to any of the full text articles? In some cases, you say PDF full text on the screen, and you click on it, and it should be able to open an article. Then there are certain li sorry, certain limiters such as scholarly peer-reviewed journals. Many times students ask me, I want a scholarly peer-reviewed journals, and do, do you know what it is? So I have to explain to them, especially to the undergraduates. You can put date code, you can also put language codes and regional focus. So that's the way you look for articles. That's one easy way to look for articles using our uh, interface. The next database, and I don't want to bore you, which is called JSTOR, everybody knows it. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to it because it's a well-established database. It was, I believe, in 1994. It was established at University of Michigan with a Mellon grant, and then it continued growing. And currently, it has also, if you see, text analyzer, which is a new feature, which is a sort of a digital humanities feature to help you locate additional citations in that box. If you click on the text analyzer and you upload your work or a, let's say citation abstract, JSTOR will pull similar articles which match your particular research topic and show you a sort of a, a link-based bibliography so that you can access the full text. One problem with the JSTOR when it comes to accessing articles is moving wall. What do I mean by that? If a journal is published in 2020, it is not necessarily might be available in the JSTOR. Uh, it, uh, you can get its 2012 copies, but then the agree agreements prohibit people, uh, JSTOR, from showing other published content, which is uh, current content. JSTOR also has a wonderful ebooks platform. And I will start with the ebooks because in JSTOR, you see, there are a lot of Latin American publishers. I'm focusing on them right now. Uh, they are Colegio de Mexico. As you see, I've highlighted on the screen a Colegio de Mexico as a publisher description. And you see a list of journals and books which can be ac accessed using the JSTOR. Besides only Colegio de Mexico, there is a UNAM. Um, then there is a Universidad de los Andes, uh, Universidad Nacional de Colombia, Universidad de Antioquia, Universidad de California, this is, this is our Universidad de Costa Rica, uh, Universidad de Valle de Cauca. There are a lot of different Latin American publishers who deposit their books, which can be accessed using JSTOR. The next one is Claxco, which is uh, Consejo Latinoamericano de Ciencias Sociales, Latin American Social Sciences Councils, and they have about 1,300 ebooks available and I will show you their search. Uh, I'll show their search screen to you that way you're aware of how it looks. So they have open access books which you can really check out and read. Let's go back. Sorry about that technical glitch. I'm, I'm catching up. One of the feature of the Claxco is Biblioteca Ayacucho. I think most of the people are familiar with it. It's one of the most important publishing initiative in Latin America, um, founded in about 1974, and in tribute to the Battle of 1824, which was meant to uh, meant to uh, lead to the political emancipation of America, according to the self description. And there are about eight collections in it, and you can search, and these are in the PDF format. And you can look for those and search for those platforms through the open access 
principles. The site is not restricted to University of California, Berkeley, but anybody can search through it. The next one is the Digitalia eBooks platform. Now, Digitalia has about, we have purchased this year uh, with, a, in, with a collaboration with a librarian for Spanish and Portuguese cloth pots. We purchased over 600 Digitalia eBooks. But before that, we have current content is about 2,600 full text eBooks, and it can be accessed through our catalog by using the function called Digit, uh, in the keyword, you type in Digitalia eBooks and you get the listing of eBooks which are fully cataloged. So you can search through them. On the screen, we see a screenshot of Digitalia which shows what books are available for us to access. Uh, there is a My Shelf function to it. So one can save in the bookshelf uh, those books and refer to them later on. There is also, you can see a screenshot of a Project Muse, where you can search for ebooks, which can be checked out to you. They are in PDF format. This is a proprietary database, both of them. You need to have either subscription to them or buy the content. UC Berkeley Library subscribes to them, so you'll be able to access those. Then people say, what about the old books? And since um, our library uh, special collection, very well known Bancroft library, their collections are kind of closed, right? Physical collections. That does not mean that we cannot look at the older eBooks. For example, there's an initiative called Primeros Libros um, from Austin, Texas, which are the first books. And on the screen, you see three screenshots. One of them is the entry point. Then you see the search function and you can search for the books. And I'm showing you as an example, a screenshot of how one can read these books on the screen. Besides Primeros Libros, Bancroft Library has its wonderful e-collections available. And also there is a John Carter Brown Library of um, John Carter, yeah, at Brown has also a, uh, their web page available through archive.org. So you'll be able to look at the books from, let's say, um, 18th, 17th centuries um, and use them for your research. Now I'm coming to the databases. I'm, in my library guide, there's a, there are a bunch of databases that you can uh, use uh, as a Berkeley student and a faculty member, and also the visiting scholar if you have CalNet privileges. I would like to highlight two of those databases. One is called Gale World Scholar, Latin America and Caribbean. Um, it will allow you to search a comprehensive range of contemporary and historical documents for the region, providing research access across the humanities, both for current Latin American and the Caribbean studies, as well as historical perspective through the colonial uh, period. Some of the items that are included in this database are Brazil's popular groups, 1966-1986, Colección de Documentos Ineditos Relativos al Descubrimiento, Conquista y Organización de las Antiguas Posesiones Españolas de América y Oceania, Conquistadores, The Struggle for Colonial Power in Latin America, 1492-1825, then I am showing you a screenshot of a database called Access World News, News Bank Newspapers. We have four distinct series of Latin America, two Latin American uh, historical newspapers which are available. Um, there was a research question on fall of Ciudad de Juarez in 1911, and somebody wanted to read something, uh, a, a headline from a news, Mexican newspaper called El Imparcial which uh, Rendicion de Juarez, it talks about it. And I was able to find the full text through it. Besides Access World News, there is another database which is called CRL, Center for Research Libraries. That is a consortium which is located in Chicago. And as a Berkeley affiliates who have proper credentials can access that database and look through the tons of Latin American and Caribbean studies newspapers. 
Access World News, which I am talking about on the screen, shows you South America, Argentina, Bolivia, and shows you the historical resources. Next. The other database which I wanted to bring your attention to, because many of the students have question about esclavitude, slavery, abolition, and social justice. So there is a Alexander Press database called Slavery, Abolition, and Social Justice. And I've, I'm showing you two screenshots. One is the landing page of it, and there is a tutorials section, as you, if, um, if you can see my pointer. And then there is a map section, so it has introduction, documents, essays, maps, further resources, et cetera, et cetera. Now we are talking about the open access. So one of the projects which I wanted to introduce today is Latin American journal, periodicals or journals project at UC Berkeley. You can see a screenshot and I'm going to open its link shortly so you can see what we have done. Um, I must give credit for this to also, advisement of Professor Tom, Thomas McEnany, who was very much interested in getting many of these journals digitized. And both of us sat down with his graduate research assistant and we decided what group of journals we are going to do first. And these are available to anybody through digital collections, dgcol.lib.berkeley.edu. I will be more than glad to share this presentation uh, with the participants, with the, with the permission, appropriate permissions of class. The other open access resource which I wanted to highlight covers Latin Amer Latino and Latin American art. And that is from the International Center for the Arts of the Americas at Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. Um, many of us have heard the name of Arte Publico Press. And in the same Houston, you find a tons and tons of digital resources uh, which are focused on Latin America. And you can see this archive. It is also open access. It's an art-related archive. So I wanted it to bring to your attention. You can either browse by author or by title, browse by date, or browse by topic. Let me open the link of our project so that you can see what we have done so far. Collections, let me just bring them up. Okay. So these are the journals and say, okay, there's a Revista Azul from Argentina. Let me open it up. I hope it shows up and I'm doing this search in live, so bear with me because it, okay, here we go. It will take some time for it to load. And if you click on 1931 issue, once it loads, it's taking time for it to load. I don't know why, what is the function, what is causing this malfunction. But you can, and I'm, I'm not making, making a fool of myself, but you will be able to see and uh, download the whole issue if you need to. It's about uh, nine megabytes, 8.9 megabytes in a PDF format. Um, it also shows you if anybody had accessed it over the period of time. It's a very new project. We just started in uh, digitizing them last year and it's a work in progress. Let's go back to our So what I did, I, I knew that this type of things happened during the presentation. So I went ahead and pulled a, a, a screenshot and it has a advanced. Okay, here. Just a second, I will be there. There you go. So you can see what you can see, which and I have tried it over and over and it works. There's an advanced search uh, interface. So you can go through the place of publication. You can go by date, date, format, and you can see actual images uh, on, on the, your screen and you can download a copy. 
Lastly, I, I am going to focus on on online media because colleagues say, I'm sitting home, I'm cooked up, I want to watch something. Can you recommend any Latin American films which are technically free? And when it, somebody says free, it kind of makes me wonder, what do they mean by that? And I'm not going to tell them to go to some Pirateria website to download movies because that's against the law. But we have access to Canopy, it's a wonderful database for you to look for documentaries, for self-education. There are a lot of films and not to sound stereotypical, but there was like, I was like, somebody was asking me, what is the difference between, cuál es la diferencia entre Chile Guajaquillo and Chile Ancho? And I was kind of lost. You know, what is the difference? And I said, okay, let me start looking. So there's a whole documentary on role of Chile in uh, Mexican cuisine. And it was, it was just fascinating. It just educated me. And you can use that for teaching classes. The recently acquired database, which is uh, focused on Latin America and part of Eastern Europe, which is called Socialism on Film. And uh, you can do some searches on former socialist block countries such as Cuba, and you will get some of the documentaries which were done by uh, the Soviet filmmakers. Uh, it is an initiative of a British film, uh, BFI, British Film Institute, I believe. Lastly, there is a very nice open access uh, database called Cine PR, Puerto Rico. So Puerto Rican films, you can watch them online. That's I believe there is no authentication required because I was able to watch some of the movies. And of course, I went to the Chilean website. I wanted to see what kind of uh, movies one can see. There are some of the video recordings which you can watch through the Memoria Chilena, uh, Biblioteca Nacional de, de Cine. So on that, okay, oh, I'm sharing my screen with you. I'm so excited. <laughs> Yeah. Technology is what it is, what you make from it. So I wanted to say thank you to you for giving me time. Um, I know that we are bound by time. I just wanted to introduce you a brief crash course. Let's put it this way in Latin American sources, which can be accessed from online in an, in an online environment and globalization as Professor Harley Shaikin had made the question, big question in front of us, is it really dead? And it has, I believe, mutated in different forms. And we are here as a librarians to, to help our community. Uh, if you have any questions, I have uh, input my contact information that will be shared with you. We periodically have tri trials of Latin American databases. And currently we have a trial of classic Bra Brazilian cinema online through Brill. And uh, all the information is on the blog. Thank you very much, Professor Shaikin and the audience for listening to me. Thank you, uh, Dr. Penze. That was, I think, an inspiring talk in so many ways, really putting together a cornucopia of databases, some familiar to be sure, others completely new to many of the viewers here. Uh, I'd like to start by asking a general question. There are many viewers right now uh, participating who may not have access to the UC Berkeley library system. Uh, what advice would you give them in terms of looking towards some of these databases? So my advice will be to access these databases through their home institutions. Many of the public libraries have limited access to these proprietary databases. Open access databases are open to everyone. Uh, anybody can utilize them. And that's why on my library guide, I have a big column. It looks like a never ending list of open access resources. I don't like to put such a never ending list, but there are some of the selected uh, databases, like there is one on Argentine newspapers. One can access historical newspapers from Rosario from 19th century. You can access those at no charge from the web. In some cases, if a, pers a person who needs a particular article from a database. As a courtesy, as a librarian that we are trained to be, we try to accommodate the request by providing them a copy of a, from, of a, of a uh, article using the fair academic use clause, but we cannot summarily download 10,000 
articles for somebody uh, who is not allowed to have access because of jurisdiction or copyright constraints. Okay, thank you. Uh, another very general question uh, that may be impossible to answer. Uh, you went through a number of new databases uh, that may be unfamiliar. Are there two or three relatively unfamiliar databases, some of which you may have just mentioned, that you would highlight right now? Uh, check these three out. So most of the people know um, from Latin America, or many of us know that there are several um, online free databases such as Redalic, and then there is a, a database called CLO Brazil, which gives access to uh, free content, free articles to a certain extent. I will highlight Biblioteca Virtual de Mexico, which has access to their books. Uh, there is an Argentine digital library and Chilean digital libraries, which are open access. You can read all of the open access contents, which, which they have digitized uh, into, through those databases. There, is a, uh, there are a lot of materials on historical homelands of Mapuche, uh, Mapundugun language. So you, you will be able to access those. So these are the databases that come to my mind uh, for general audiences who might not have access to proprietary databases. Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to ask a question uh, from someone who sent it in on, on chat. And I'd say to everyone again, if you have a question, send it to Janet Host and we'll try to get to it. And if we don't get to it, we will submit the questions uh, to Lilidar uh, after this uh, webinar, and he may be able to answer some of them online. Uh, this is a specific question for Berkeley from Elena from Oakland. Do we know anything more about the plans for reopening the Bancroft? Also, what is the capacity of Doe, that's uh, the principal library on campus, uh, for reopening or scanning materials for researchers this summer? All right, so as you know, we are in the situation of flux. Some, there are phased opening of certain areas uh, as mandated by the public health laws of California. Library adheres to the UC Berkeley's organizational principles and policies, as well as the local county, as well as state and federal laws. So opening, as I understand, will take place in phases, phase zero, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. And if you're telling me to look and pinpoint a specific date on my calendar, um, it will be a folly of my, my judgment because we don't know how this particular pandemic will proceed. We are also seeing, working from home every day, trying to meet user needs. Uh, if she has any specific questions for some of the items, uh, Online Archive of California, there are some digitized content. Calisphere, which is a UC initiative. I wanted to show that screen to you, but because of the lack of time, uh, I refrain from showing it to you. You'll be able to do some searches in there. Doe Library is also part of UC Berkeley library system, and they are in the almost annex. They are close to each other. Means they're connected, Bancroft and Doe, to a certain extent. And we work with Bancroft curators so I cannot give the concrete answer. So stay tuned for more information from the Chancellor's Leadership Office and the committee which is working on COVID-19 type of things. Thank you. And I would point out that we will be posting new information in this area uh, on the website uh, for the Center for Latin American Studies at Berkeley. That's clas.berkeley.edu. Uh, I have a comment uh, from Emily, and then a question from Monica. Emily's comment is, uh, this is not a question, but please convey uh, immense gratitude to Lilidar for his work and for walking us through all of this. We are so lucky to have him. I personally would endorse this. I've learned a lot as well as uh, I suspect most of those of you who are part of this. Uh, and then the question from Monica is, 
uh, accessing contemporary fiction from the Southern Cone in Brazil. If a Latin American movie is not on Berkeley canopy, can the library get it? We are prioritizing e-acquisitions right now. So if she's affiliated with the Berkeley, by all means, send, send me the request and I will forward it to the appropriate department or a curator who can consider possibilities of buying it for the user, uh, for the teaching or for the class consumption or for research. It is decided case by case basis. One of the scenarios uh, which I rather not go into the detail is that some of the books which were $40 per se in a physical copy are currently getting retailed at $371 for multi-user access. This is not all the books, but I have encountered some kind of price changes. So we are debating on how to solve this issue. But we are here for you. So send us a request um, through, through class to me, and I'll be more than glad to help you out. Uh, this is a question um, from Elisa. Uh, what other media is available? Audio, podcast, music. Thank you from a librarian in Oakland. Oh, wow. So we have access to, for music, we have access to Naxos Music, music Library. Um, I will be more than glad to share that link with you uh, through the class. And you can um, listen to different types of music, including samba and, uh, you know, a lot of different genres. Besides that, there is an open access resource uh, created by UCLA, which is called Frontera Project. And in that you have LP, long play, those discs uh, are digitized and you can listen to them. In some cases, and I don't want to be misquoted here, uh, some of the content providers have provided temporary COVID-19 access to those. Um, some of the classical music databases, as I recall, because we had a lot of emails going back and forth. So I'll be more than glad to answer those questions. You know, uh, I don't want to say YouTube, whole world knows about YouTube. So there are some documentaries but I don't know whether they can be used in class teaching. Maybe perhaps the segments, you know, and I'm not legal because of the copyright issues. Thank you. And we'd like to ask everyone who has a comment uh, on the webinar today, uh, both positive or critical in ways we might be able to improve, to send, a, send it to Janet, uh, host. Uh, and we will look at this and we will try to answer some of your questions, as I mentioned, by sending them to Lilidar uh, and his own virtual office hours that we will post on the class.berkeley.edu website. Uh, and we look forward to this being an ongoing conversation for those who are interested. We look forward to doing future webinars on researches research during a time of pandemic for Latin American studies and would like to have Lilidar come back. So Lilidar, I'd like to ask you, do you have any concluding remarks you'd like to make? The times are tough for all of us. As a librarians, we are here to meet your needs as much as we can through our e-resources. And I wanted to once again thank class Professor Shaiken, Julia, Janet, Anna de Carolis, and Greg for always being supportive of my initiatives. Uh, when I joined the library and when I was tasked to do Latin America, uh, it was a big challenge. Pero si se puede. So we are here, we can get it done, we are here to help you. Y si queremos información en español, aquí estamos, queremos. Falamos Portuguese, now ten problema now. So if you need any help, I'm here for you. Just reach out to us through class and we'll be, we'll be more than glad to help you. So thank you again, stay safe and be well. Thank you again. Thank you, Lilidar, and thank you all for attending this uh, today. Uh, it is inspiring for us, not simply to be part of a, a community at UC Berkeley, but to be part of a community that spans cities and institutions across the globe, across the United States. We look forward on building on this community. Uh, and with that, thank you for being here and we'll be concluding this broadcast.